Hello everybody and welcome to another spoiler review. This time we're going to be talking about The Talon of Horus. So, this book came out a long time ago. Um, I'm not sure if it was March or September uh, in 2014. What was it? 2014 anyway, definitely. So, this has been on the on the range for a long time and I remember reading it at the time and thinking this is awesome book and then everything else has come out afterwards and I completely forgot about all the details but I uh, managed to get a hold of the uh, used audible shameless shill please use my audible link below where you can choose from a great selection of black library audio books just like Talon of Horus and Black Legion anyway yes yeah, so I, I picked up uh, the Talon of Horus one because um I figured I could listen to it on the way to work and stuff rather than reading it because I've just bought Black Legion and after reading the first couple of pages I realised I need to I need to go back and uh, reread this one. So yeah, it's um it's been a long time and I have to say some of the stuff a lot of people say Games Workshop down sets things up that far in advance but um in terms of some of the things that are mentioned in this I mean yeah, it's not sort of hammered out completely but um you can see where they were going with the whole uh, black library thing with the whole full acadia thing it's it's there maybe something happened where they decided to push things back or they decided to extend things i, I don't know i don't know people would have to look at the timeline of events in terms of like the corporate side and then what they got the law writers to do the law keepers to do up at gw and black library but um yeah, yeah, it, this, this is completely in sync with what's um, happened since, and yeah, it's awesome. I mean, so yeah, if, if anyone's uh, not listened to one of these before, we do a, uh, I say I do, you guys have got nothing to do with it. We do a quick overview of the book, of the author, and then we'll go into a sort of spoiler rundown of the thing. And I think I'll go into some detail on this one, being as it's a fairly old book, um, a lot of people will have read it anyway, and this will be sort of just a refresher. I guess, if you haven't had a chance to reread it before Black Legion came out. The book came out uh, in 2014, so it's old. Um, it's been out for a while, but uh, the new Black Legion book has come out, and that's book two of this series. And uh, yeah, yeah, before we go any further, fucking awesome. So yeah, Aaron Damsky bowden is the writer here, and uh, I know it's got, he's got a bit of a... I don't know what to say with Aaron Damsky bowden I think he's amazing, but I noticed there's a lot of... Um, what would you say... He's got some people who are annoyed with him in terms of the things he's done. But I think they're fantastic. I mean, it, to be fair, it shows a great knowledge of um, whether he's got this or not and whether it's just sort of natural instinct from him. I assume it, he, he knows what he's talking about. But in terms of like the religious aspects of things, faith, theolo- theology, uh, you know, history, the, the best Black Library guys, they wrote this stuff in on there. And I don't know whether I'm just reading too much into it, but I think there's definitely those elements. And I think they get... They get away with things more in the novels than they do in, say, uh, your supplements and your sort of general stuff. Things that I suppose some people might find... I know, I've heard that some people find stuff offensive when when it comes to religious stuff, but uh, I, don't, I don't really care. <laughs> I think it's pretty awesome. Um, I'm not a religious person myself, so it's all just... Um, it's interesting to see these, these ideas plonked into this universe. And, yeah, Aaron dembski Baden's really good at this. I mean, he's... Uh, his Night Lord series is a must for anyone. If you haven't seen it, uh, I would definitely recommend that in terms of no uh, understanding the Astartes mindset or understanding the traitor Astartes mindset. And this book does the same. Black, Le- uh, Black Legion. Talon of Horus is a fantastic uh, introduction to this history of the Black Legion, of Abaddon, of the Legion Wars within the eye of the Black Crusades. Uh, if he does, if he runs from this all the way to the Siege of Cadia, I mean, yeah, you're looking at 13 books, definitely, probably more. It's it's a fantastic series, and and it's gonna be way better than the uh, the the Orc one, the Beast Rises, which seemed like an odd one. Which again, going from the date of these, sorry if you can hear anything in the background. I have got some neighbours doing some work on their house. If uh, you look at the date that that was released up to now and then what's come out in between it looks to me like the beast arises was kind of filler but i don't know i'm not i'm not anyway in touch with the internal machinations and planning and project planning of the uh of black library's uh team i have no idea all i know is what they release and what they say it does look like that was maybe filler 
while they change plans. But I don't know. Maybe other people know more than me. I don't know. The book itself is fantastic and is definitely recommended. And again, a shameless show. And this will probably be my last shameless show. You can go down below and get a link to the book on Amazon. And yeah, if you use that link, it helps me out. But uh, you can also use Audible to get an audio book of it for free. So it's really well written. It's um, fantastically put together. And yeah, the story just flows. And I like the fact that it doesn't actually come from Abaddon's perspective Without going into spoilers so much, it basically shows the, uh, basically telling the story of how Abaddon began the Black Legion, began the Crusades, and yeah, it's the origin point, and it's told from the perspective of a Thousand Sun Sorcerer who has joined him, who or who will join him. I think, I think we just have to go straight into spoilers, to be completely honest, and uh, discuss and break down the lore in the book, because <laughs> there's not much else to say, really. It's uh, it's Aaron Dembski Bowden, so if you know Black Library, you know it's going to be good, and it's covering a fantastic area of the lore that hasn't really been explored in terms of an actual serial uh, series, you know, something that's telling a, a big story. You get one-off things with uh, chaos stuff, um, you know, and they pop up in other stuff. Obviously, they're one of the main protagonists of the universe. But to have to have these guys is, yeah, to have this series is going to be is going to be really sort of enriching, and it really brings them to life. It adds a character to them. They are not just evil demons, as the Imperium <laughs> thinks they are. You know, um, it sort of humanizes them, I suppose, to a certain degree. Well, to a great degree, I suppose. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's it's rich, it's rich. And, and it's the things it explores, it builds on. And I assume that, you have to assume that whatever Darren Ensky Baden says becomes canon, becomes law. Because he knows what he's doing and he seems to be trusted by them. So, yeah, the things that are mentioned in this book are quite startling, very startling. And for some reason, I completely forgot the fucking end of this book. <laughs> but we'll get to that soon. Yes, so I will begin spoilering and running down the book in five. So go away in a minute. Five, four, three, two, one. Spoiler time. Okay, so let's go and uh, explore the story. Yeah, so I've got dogs and I've got my neighbours working on stuff, so I apologise. Right, so the story begins from the point of view of Iskander Kayan, who is a Emperor's Children sorcerer, one of the most powerful sorcerers within that legion. Um, in fact, uh, we hear later, well, isn't that a Black Legion? Well, basically, Araman is uh, the most powerful sorcerer, obviously, after Magnus, and he considers Iskander to be the only person who comes close to him. Not better than him, obviously, but, you know, close. So, um, after the Legions fled Terra, they all fled into the Eye. They all started kicking off against the against the Sons of Horus because they felt that it was all their fault that they'd lost the whole thing so they made war on them and tried basically to try and annihilate them I suppose but the other legions with all of the things that happened with them for instance the uh, the rubric with the Thousand Sons the way the Primarchs had turned out many of, uh, of them ascending to demonhood and so on the scattered nature of it all uh, the breakdown of authority within the legions and everything it's it's chaos it's it's chaos in more ways than one and Iskander is one of the guys who's broken off on his own he's taken his ship that he commanded he's taken his forces um they're now rubric marines um of course he was one of the ones who tried to stop Araman performing his ritual uh, we learn and basically, he's been cruising around the universe doing whatever he, he does, selling his skills to the highest bidder as a sorcerer. Uh, he has his company of Rubric Marines, there's about 100 of them. He's got another sorcerer with him called Ajikai. Yeah, yeah, it's the the characterizations are fantastic um, in terms of uh, Iskander himself. He's not some blood crazed or corrupt. He is corrupt in a way in his way and from the Imperium's perspective definitely so he's looking for something he's looking for value in life he's looking for purpose and uh, he's a great warrior um, a great warrior sorcerer 
and he's disgusted with the degeneracy of the various legions of the powers of chaos but he's got a sort of you have to embrace chaos you have to trust it it's a tool he's one of these guys you know he doesn't worship the gods but he understands the warp in a sort of as a as an element you know to be used um and uh, yeah it's he, he he presents a very philosophical attitude towards the whole thing which i think are some of the best chaos characters when they do this um rather than you know just worshiping the gods in you know in a sort of blood crazed manner that's sort of iskander and he's our main plot device i suppose basically it's uh, told from his perspective recounting the rise of the black legion to some inquisitors who are interrogating him because he's surrendered himself to the Imperium. It's the year 999M41. He has surrendered himself. They have blinded him. They have cut off his psychic powers. They have chained him to a wall. And a scribe is writing down everything he says. Because he says he's going to tell them the story. He's going to tell them the truth. And that's what he does. Um, and that's what this is going to be. Uh, this whole story. And I would assume the Black, Li- uh, the Black Legion will be along the same lines. But basically, yeah, it's told from his perspective the whole way through, and it's him recounting this story of what happened, um, what's going on. Now, he has some... There's some things in there I'm not going to spoil because, you know, it seems a bit pointless. But we'll get to the main story itself and some of the awesome bits that are in there. Uh, So he's recounting this story, and basically he receives a distress signal from an old comrade in the Sons of Horus, uh, Falcus Kibre, who we know from the Horus Heresy, and he's a pretty long-standing character. They meet up with them and also another fella uh, called Liveran Ukris, uh, who is also known as Firefist, which is a bit of a piss-take name because he got his hands blown off. <laughs> and people keep calling him it, and he keeps telling them not to call him it. Be Yeah, he was a heavy weapons specialist, and he got his hands blown off, so they call him Firefist, which is hilarious, to be honest. Anyway... Uh, they meet up because the Sons of Horus homeworld within the Eye, main world within the Eye, Lupercalia, where Horus's body was kept, has been destroyed. Um, the Third Legion and a number of other legions have gathered together to finally smash them. Now, that doesn't mean the, fir- the Sons of Horus are extinct or anything. A lot of warbands broke off from them and they're viewed as any other desperate band of warriors would be because they've turned their backs on the sons of horus legion they sort of turned it into a shrine world a fortress world and it has finally fallen now falcus has come to ask for aid because they are all concerned that uh, old fabius boyle which again if you've listened to these reviews you know i've been following the progress of his little storyline he's going to clone and of course the elements of this are covered in his story so I'll be interested to see how they overlap and hopefully they do a good job of uh, linking the tales together and there's no inconsistencies which I I worry could happen because at the minute I think it's borderline but um, if more details are added uh, yeah things could get a bit uh, muddy in terms of law lining up but anyway they've taken Horace's body and um, they want to clone him and yeah (laughs) <laughs> they're not happy about this because they don't want to see Horus return he's dead, he failed and no one wants that but if the Third Legion get him, they could become the sort of predominant power within the universe because uh, somehow they'll have him loyal to them, I guess anyway, that's the story basically but also a word bearer has emerged, a sorcerer who can has told them that they can he can lead them to the vengeful spirit which disappeared some time ago after entering the void uh, Ezekiel took the ship sorry about that I had to step away Um, there was a lot of noise going on (laughs) with my neighbours and dogs and deliveries so yeah where were we I think we were talking about this Sargon dude the word bearer's sorcerer so basically it turns out in the end that he was sent by Ezekiel Abaddon himself to uh, recruit like-minded individuals who could be used to form the core of the new Black Legion. And, yeah, yeah, he basically uh, tells them that he can help them find the Vengeful Spirit, and they want to find the Vengeful Spirit because Falcus Kibre wants to have vengeance on the Third Legion, and Iskander is a sucker for a brother. (laughs) <laughs> he wants to feel like he's part of something and he feels that uh, the loyalty 
I suppose it's it's an opportunity for him to actually have something to fight for, to uh, be loyal and uh, to fight for his friend. So that's what they do. Unfortunately, they are ambushed by the Emperor's children, who are after Falcus, who it's not clear how they found them, but anyway, they come. They're led by one Telemachon, which I believe is someone who showed up in the uh, Horus Heresy. I cannot remember. And I think it's the 55th Company or something like that. Anyway... Basically, he's got this warband of Emperor's children, he's a fairly strong commander, and they are meeting on the derelict hulk of a ship that is sort of in the no-man's land. And the Emperor's children attack. And a battle ensues, the Emperor's children board this ship where they were meeting, uh, Iskander uses a portal to transport himself around, rather than going on, you know, thunderhawks and shuttles and stuff, because he's a sorcerer, why not? So he splits a sort of tear in reality. And um, he rests after a, a scrap, which I'll get into in a second. Basically, they escape to his ship, and Falcus disappears on his own ship with Sargon, and we come back to them shortly. During this battle is one of the reasons why Darren Amsky Bowden and I think a few of the very best writers have got have got a fantastic knowledge of history, and they've mingled real theology and history together uh, with the sort of mechanics of the warp in the 41st millennium to create something awesome. So basically, if you don't know history, there was a crusade called the uh, the, the, the Long Dock Crusades against the Cathars, which are a heretic, heretical group of Christians, basically, back in the day. Um, I won't go into detail with this. There's plenty of places you can find this information out. Yeah, it all revolves around the stories about the Grail and uh, one of the f- uh, Pope Innocents and everything. So that's in this, and apparently this whole saga, because of the horrors of it, and it was pretty horrible, horrible. <laughs> you know, I think it was, uh, is it Simon de Montfort? Um, I forget which one, I forget. Yeah, it was pretty grim, anyway, shall we say. So, yeah, um... This is in the south of France, or Francia, if we're talking about the 41st millennium. All the actions, the blood that was spilled during this crusade gave birth to a demon, a bloodthirster, who is the sort of, in the visage of a a knight. You know, he's got that look about him, but he's a bloodthirster. And Iskander has captured this guy and a number of other demons, and he says himself, he doesn't really, it's like collecting Pokemon. <laughs> he doesn't collect any old demon, he collects more esoteric demons. And uh, this is one of them that he's uh, that he's captured, and he keeps them in a deck of cards, and he can unleash them from his card deck <laughs> on the enemy. And it is it is like Pokemon, yeah. And basically, this guy uh, gets unleashed, and uh, there's all kinds of fun that happen. Basically, in the end, after a fantastic battle scene, this Talamakan guy and a number of other Empress children are captured and taken back to Iskander's ship, and they run off. Now, they make their way to a sort of forge world that's run by a heretic uh, tech priest woman in alliance with a Iron Warriors commander. And it's a sort of a waypoint, a fuel and resupply point. Uh, you can go there and barter and trade and get uh, your ships fixed up. You can buy weaponry, ammunition and so on. And they maintain strict neutrality in the, neut- in the Legion Wars. Yeah, Iskander's on good terms with these people. It appears that Falcus has made his way there. Uh, his ship was um, thrown out of the warp or the, the Eye of Terror. It was found in a stretch of the Eye of Terror by these people, and they've taken the ship as scrap payment, <laughs> but uh, healed up the uh, guys, and they're going to let Iskander take them. So far, so good. There's a lot of personal story that's going on there, a lot of background information on these individual characters, and then these things branch off. For instance, Iskander's haunted by recollections of the fall of Prospero, and he was one of the Thousand Sons who wasn't transported to the planet of sorcerers when Magnus fled after his defeat by Rus. He was stuck on the planet and managed to survive, and basically made his way there eventually. Yeah, I mean... (sighs) Yeah, I could, I could go on for a long time, but I'm trying to keep it reasonably snappy. But basically, they're after the vengeful spirit because they want vengeance. And yeah, they 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 get to know each other more. You get to know the characters, and then it progresses through to them eventually finding the vengeful spirit. And what they find is the ship has been shut down, and Ezekiel Abaddon is there, and he has been using it as 
his own personal base. It's this is um oh Christ I've got to talk about this. Okay, so this is another fantastic section of the story. There's an area of the Eye of Terror where the the sort of the light of the Astronomicon flows through the eye and it drives demons insane, it drives populations insane. With the flowing of the water, imagine light going through water, uh, how it creates the shards, shafts of light. You get me? So when one of them shines through, the power of the Emperor hits the chaos population and causes damage to them. Either, you know, demonic forces break apart or they go insane and the local population of mutants and beastmen <laughs> and people who aren't corrupted as well, they also uh, go on a madden because of the force of this, of the anathema. But yeah, I think I think I like that. I like that way of describing it. Yeah, it's like uh, shafts of light going through water. That's how to imagine it within the Eye of Terror. But this is for the those with the sight, those with the art, I should say. And Iskander has a thing about people calling it magic. He's really disgusted by this. And I've just I've just read the first few pages of Black uh, Black Legion, and already that little gag's come in. And that's the thing again. And I like Darren M. Adam because he puts jokes in, and they're not obvious jokes. They're uh, they're clever jokes. It's it's funny. It's not joke a joke per se. It's just funny. So they progress through this area and they're assailed by a uh, a shard I suppose a shard of the Emperor's mind and if you've read the old Inquisitor, Inquisitorial War series the one with Draco and they go to the throne room and everything you'll know that um, and from other stuff of course the Emperor's mind is broken into shards and uh, yeah yeah this is one of those shards and it asks them to turn back from this course of action uh, because it believes that, well, and rightly so, it'll be the end of the Imperium, as they know it. And, yeah, the uh, Firefish shoots him. (laughs) But uh, you have some awesome moments there. I should say, Iskander's got a... um, He's got a couple of little sidekicks himself. He's got his Rubric Marines, obviously, and he's got his mate, the uh, other Chaos Sorcerer, the other Thousand Sun Sorcerer. But he's also got a Dark Elf, uh, a Dark Elf, sorry, a Dark Eldar uh, with him, uh, a woman, and she's pretty badass. Uh, she's, uh, we don't know the story behind that. She's his blood ward. And we get hints and stuff about the possible origins of it, and I'm, I'm assuming that'll be something he's saving for another book. Yeah, I'm I'm intrigued by the whole thing. Yeah, uh, there's not much to say really. It's it, she goes around killing things, and she's his best buddy, and they kind of got some weird kind of relationship going on there. I don't think it's sexual because she's a filthy Xenos, but uh, he does seem to be like in love with her. I suppose like a pet, maybe. I don't know. Then again, she seems to be the same way. And obviously she's having a hard time because she's in the warp, so the the thirst that they all have, the Dark Elder, uh, to ward off the Slaneshi power over them that drains their slow souls is particularly strong. But basically she's in the Eye of Terror because she can't... If she stays out of the Eye of Terror, her, uh, her fellow Dark Eldar are after her for some reason. But well, no doubt that story will get a, an answer soon. So yeah, they go to this area, they go through there, they get this uh, ghost of the Emperor coming to talk to them, and they reach the Vengeful Spirit. And there is Ezekiel, and he is not the man he was. Uh, he is not bellicose anymore. He's not the Ezekiel from the Horus Heresy. You know, he's not belligerent. I mean, well, he probably still is. But he's grown as a character, I suppose. And uh, his knowledge has grown as well. He's he isn't a psyker, but he has control of the warp um, to a startling degree. And Iskander can see this. Oh, Iskander's got a, a a tutelary still. His tutelary that he had at the before the heresy, which um, now he knows is a demon, obviously because he knows what the fuck's going on. And it's in the shape of a wolf, which it took the form of when it slew a wolven that was trying to kill him on Prospero. It sort of inhabited its body and blew it to pieces <laughs> and then took its form. Yeah, there's there's awesome bits like this. It's quite it's quite fascinating. Uh, you, you need if you haven't read it, you definitely need to read it. Uh, I'm not doing it justice at all, but this is just a rough rundown. 
but the lore elements of this are fantastic and yeah it, it really it it really uh it gets the old noggin jogging you know it really tickles the old uh tickles the old brain stem to see real world stuff molded crafted around this um you can tell these guys read a lot and they know a lot and i respect that a great deal it uh <laughs> it's it's it makes the world really rich and uh adds depth so where were we they get to the vengeful spirit they meet ezekiel ezekiel's got a massive museum of all the shit he's done he's like the badass most badass person ever you know it's like it's his home base he's got weapons there he's got everything there but he's also got there the talon of horus and when he opens it, Ezekiel loses his fucking mind because it's been preserved since the moment Ezekiel took it from Horace's body. And we'll talk about Ezekiel in a second. But yeah, it, 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 we have an excellent moment where it's as if he can understand the trauma that's on the Blood Angels because of the blood of Sanguinius and the Emperor that's on there. It's truly shocking, you know. It's There's such power in it. So yeah, uh, Ezekiel... Um, after they fled to the eye, he just, he left the Legion, he left the Sons of Horus, he was done with that war, he was done with them, um, He and since then obviously he's been wandering around, apparently he's been to every world in the Eye of Terror, and it's been about a thousand years, I think, we're approaching it soon, it's been a, within the warp, it's hard to tell, but it's been a very long time for them, but in the real universe, this is before the First Crusade, which I believe is M41, M31 or M32, I can't remember. It's before Cadia's even been colonised, you know, and there is a sort of peace in the universe, in the Imperium. And I think that's when the Beast of Roses comes up. Yeah, I think that's how it syncs up. And then, yeah, you have the Beast of Roses thing, and then you have the Black Legion begin their crusades. But yeah, this is before then, obviously. It's all prologue. So, Ezekiel speaks to them, and it's they're all in awe of him he's offering them the opportunity to join a new legion to build a new world and to fight a new war the long war and to do this they're going to have to conquer the eye and unite all the disparate forces there and destroy those who refuse to accept the new order um he's a warrior king and these guys have been looking for this kind of the guys with Iskander, this band of uh, astartes and so on that they are sick of wondering. They are sick of fighting pointlessly, um, just for personal pleasure and satisfaction. And they they want in, and they join Abaddon. And Abaddon's plan is that they have to destroy Horus's body. It's also apparent that he's been planning this for a very long time, and he chose those these guys specifically, and Iskander specifically, because they were the ones who still had their brains. They were the ones who were not satisfied with the current status quo. They were the ones who want something more and yeah he, he sought them out and he's found them so what they do is they go against the canticle city which is the home world within the eye of the emperor's children now we've heard mention of this in a number of different things and again i need to read that book about uh, khan and scalathrax because there's some fascinating stuff going on here and i think i'm probably going to end up doing a law series when scorn ghost is finished up on the black legion but that's going to be a massive project massive because i want to do it properly you know god's ghost has been a good way for me to sort of develop my skills and uh yeah anyway that's a, that's a completely different conversation they go against the canticle city and like in the primogenitor it's hinted at what's happened there and fabius refusing to lead the remnants because Hor uh, abaddon comes along and stomps the canticle city how it works is eventually, basically, they throw a fucking warship into the heart of the city and it creates extinction-level forces on this planet. This is their home world. This is the home of their Phoenix Court, where the commanders of the Third Legion were. Their fleet is based there. They smash through with a vengeful spirit, which is the greatest ship in existence, pretty much. Within the Imperium, within the warp, everywhere. It's, it's one of the last... The only thing that's comparable is probably Phalanx, uh, Phalanx, um, the, Empress, the, the Imperial Fists, uh, <laughs> Imperial Fists sort of um, fortress monastery thing, and potentially some of the uh, Black Templars ships. I think they've got one as well, but it's a Gloriana battle cruiser, and it's it's the bollocks still. You know, it's the greatest thing ever made. Um, I'll be interested to know what happens to the Emperor's ship. 
I know there's right. This is a completely different thing. This is a complete sidetrack. But I remember in old law, phalanx was used to crash into the imperial spaceport to stop reinforcements during the siege of Terra. That doesn't appear to have happened. So I'm thinking they're probably going to use the Emperor's flagship, which is this giant gold thing that can't go too close to planets because it will start ripping apart their planetary crust <laughs> because of the uh, forces that are being bumped along because it's basically a, a, a mini planet the size of it. I reckon they're going to launch that into the during the Siege of Terror and that's going to be destroying the main spaceport. But that's a completely different thing. I don't know why I'm talking about that. They go after the Canticle City. They throw the ship at there. It destroys this city it, it's basically crippled the third legion it's knocked out their leadership and that's what we see later on in that and lucius novel as well um the echoes of that event and yeah fabius bile has successfully cloned primarchs the ones that they basically uh determine that one of the ships that's fleeing the planet is fabius bile's ship and um they board it they fight their way through and they meet fabius in a laboratory and the laboratory has experiments everywhere which of course fabius bar they have attempted to clone all of the primarchs and it's apparent which ones are which you can see them but they are wrong they are deformed and yeah fabius is really upset <laughs> and they seem quite shocked that he's, he's just come up to them and saying you've you've really damaged me i dare you blah 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 and uh, basically horace has been reborn and they have a fight with Horus, and it appears that he is Horus, but he hasn't got the blessings of chaos on him. He's Horus before then. The condition of his mind, whether it's cloned his memories or whether he's uh, sort of, it's he only partly understands who he is, or whether he's a blank slate, is unclear. Fabius has given him Worldbreaker, his mace and his armor, which I assume was probably on his corpse actually. Whether they've cloned him or just resurrected the body, I don't know. It's not super clear but anyway after a great fight where Iskander nearly dies it comes down to Ezekiel slaying Horus a wounded Horus with a the talon of Horus in his chest and that's the end of that now whether um, we know later in the Lucius book in the Lucius novel we know that uh, he was sent by Fulgrim to kill the clone of Fulgrim that Fabius had made and yeah so he seems to have been at it the whole time but in the Fabius Bile novels as well I think it kind of hints that he says like that's no it's no answer they aren't they aren't going to help they won't be of use to resurrect the Primarchs to try and control them so that's why he's trying to create a new form of humanity again that's a whole different tract and we have a new Fabius Bile novel coming in a few months so I'm quite excited about what's going to happen there but um yeah yeah that's how this novel ends. So Iskander is basically in this cell recounting this story. And I assume that's how it's going to carry on throughout this series. And I really hope they do a full series. All 13 books would be amazing. I mean, some of the Black Crusades haven't got much detail about them. And we know now some of the purposes of them. Um, the Gothic Sector one will be a big deal. But potentially that would be... I mean, if you can fit that in one novel, fine, but I suppose that you might not be doing it justice because it's supposed to be such a big element of the story. But we'll see what happens. I'm really excited about this series. I think it's great. And I, I hope Aaron Dembski Bowden does them himself and they don't split it off to other authors because I think it gets... Um, information gets a bit muddled when you've got different authors chipping in on the same story. Well, Horus Heresy has had this problem now and again. But uh, they seem to keep a, a firmer line on it. I know The Beast of Rises was a shit show. Uh, <laughs> it was okay. It was nowhere near... I don't know. I wasn't keen on it anyway. I stopped reading after a while as well. I didn't even finish the series. Nothing against the individual authors who wrote it. I mean, they did fine on their pieces. But some of the books were... It was disjointed. And I didn't like it. It felt rushed. But yeah, in terms of The Talon of Horus, I recommend it... I can't express how much I recommend it. And the Black Legion, from the few pages of Red, it looks like it's going to be good too. And I'll do a review of that when I've finished. So, yeah, if you are interested in chaos, if you're interested in how the universe became what it is now in this new dark age of the Imperium, then this is the one to, to read. And it's really setting up the prologue for this entire new age and for the 40, for, for the entirety of 40k to be completely honest 
what's been going on. And I think we're going to get some fantastic data on some fantastic stories out of this. And yeah, this is a great novel and I highly recommend it. And for my last shill, please use the link below to pick up the audiobook if you want to just be able to listen to it on the on the fly without having to read it. And you should get through it probably quicker than normal. Uh, yeah. I want the audiobook as well. It's got Jonathan Keeble. And he's, he's probably my favourite. He's got to be my favourite, to be honest. He's just the voices. It's a bit cringy when he does women's voices, but I'll let, I'll let that pass. <laughs> so, yeah, highly recommended. Definitely pick it up. And if you're going to go for Black Legion, you need to read this first, definitely. Definitely. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to follow what's going on. But, uh, yeah, I will see you next time for another spoiler review. Thanks for watching. I've been the Bonder Prince. I'll see you next time. Cheers.